Hello, I'm Kendall House, and this presentation is called What are the Limits of Direct Reciprocity? In this presentation, we're going to answer two major questions and a lot of little questions. Our first big question is, what is direct reciprocity? And our second big question is, is there a size limit to achieving cooperation through direct reciprocity. So let's review for a minute and try to gather some context from what we've already studied. So far we've examined two roads to cooperation. One of those is based on inclusive fitness and that of course derives from Hamilton's rule where R is the coefficient of relatedness and we've come to understand that how closely we're related to one another can help shape how easy it is to cooperate. We've also looked at reciprocity and in this case we found using what we called Axelrod's rule that relatedness wasn't required but rather a willingness to exchange benefits that exceed the cost now in the case of Hamilton's rule, we said that there was an outer limit, and this is conceptualized quite easily if we look at the inheritance systems of mammals like humans, and relatedness falls off at the level of 50% with each step out, so that a niece is half as closely related to us as a child, and a cousin is half as closely related as a niece, that's a first cousin, and because of that, we suggested that there was probably a size limit to Hamilton's rule. We can discuss this in terms of the question, how big can a society based on kinship become? And the answer is going to be, well, how many close relatives can you have, say at the level of first cousins or closer? Now among some of the social insects that are classified as Hymenoptera, they have a rather different system of inheritance and as a result they're able to maintain closer relatedness. They also have a different system of reproduction than humans and as a result some of the Hymenoptera societies can get very large and have thousands of close relatives like this nest of wasp. But when we look at human beings it would appear that the number is going to be smaller and indeed, an anthropologist named Napoleon Chagnon suggested that if a society is glued together by kinship, the upper limit is going to be a couple hundred people who will be able to live together in a village. And as a village gets larger than a couple hundred and relatedness declines, that village will shatter and split into new villages. But of course, relatedness is not necessary to reciprocity, and this might lead us to ask, well, is there a size limit to Axelrod's rule? Is there a size limit to reciprocity? Because we know that, in fact, humans do live in societies that are larger than a couple of hundred people. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back and review again. So in the case of Hamilton's rule, we noted that altruism can evolve most easily when relatedness is high. And if we compare Axelrod's rule, we can also say that altruism will evolve most easily when the probability of interacting again is high, when W is high. And our question now is, can W remain high? Can we maintain a high probability of interacting as our societies get larger. So the question that W raises is this. What's the probability that two actors will encounter each other again? So here we have orange sacrificing for blue in our standard example that we've been using. Well obviously reciprocity cannot happen if they never meet again. So what we're asking with W is what's the probability that they can meet again and that the benefit that orange provides to blue can be reciprocated. 
So it's important before we go forward to specify the kind of reciprocity we're talking about because reciprocity comes in several forms. And what we're talking about in this presentation is what's called direct reciprocity. And this is where the benefits flow back and forth between two partners. And as it happens, the mathematician Martin Nowak has a formula for defining when reciprocity is possible in this direct manner. You can find it in his book that he's edited recently called Evolution, Games, and God on pages 101, 102, and that's by Harvard University Press. And Nowak's formula is that W must be greater than the cost divided by the benefit or the ratio of the cost to the benefit. And we can say that what this means is that the probability of interacting again has to exceed the cost-benefit ratio. We're talking about the cost to the altruistic donor and the benefit to the recipient of that altruistic act. And what it means, if we kind of work the math in a simple way here, is this. If our probability of meeting again is 10%, then the benefit has to be 10 times the cost. If we raise the probability of meeting again to 20%, then the benefit has to be only five times the cost. And it would appear then that as the probability of meeting again goes up, the cost and benefits can get more equal. They can approach equality more and more closely. We can see this that if the probability of meeting again is raised to 50%, then the benefit only needs to exceed the cost by two times, a little more than two times. All right, so as we get more and more certain that we'll meet again, reciprocity presumably becomes more and more possible. So let's put that in plain English without the math. And basically what we're suggesting is that direct reciprocity thrives best when individuals repeatedly interact and have a high likelihood of repeatedly interacting. So now we need to think about how this possibility of repeatedly interacting is related to the size of a human society. And unsurprisingly, if we reflect on that, it's been suggested that direct reciprocity doesn't apply to large human groups. And this argument has been made, for example, by Herbert Gintis and Samuel Bulls in their book, A Cooperative Species, by Princeton University Press. You'll find that on page 63. So evidently, direct reciprocity has size limits. And to conceptualize this in a non-mathematical way, uh, just think about a small foraging camp of five to 50 individuals. Uh, like the Hadza or the Zutwazi or other foragers who are, have scarce resource situations. And then just pose the question, how likely is it that any two hunter-gatherers will interact again and again if they're living in this very small community together? And we can imagine that it's probably going to be a pretty good likelihood that they'll meet one another again. And now, think instead about a big city like Singapore or New York City or Amsterdam. And now how likely is it that two strangers will meet again? Now it may very well be that in that city you have friends, let's say, that you meet every Monday for coffee. Well then reciprocity can emerge from that relationship, but what about between strangers who've never met before and don't have plans to meet again? What's the likelihood that they'll simply encounter one another? And if we say, well, that must be very low, then the question arises, how can reciprocity, direct reciprocity, possibly enable big cities to exist? Because we know that big cities exist and big human societies exist, but it appears that we can't explain their existence based on direct reciprocity. And that's the point of this whole presentation that it appears that humans are able to form societies much larger than we would expect, given the limits of direct reciprocity. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it.